Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our November webinar. My name is Craig Latham, and I'm the Executive Director of NERI. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Hashtag Cyber Offenses, Trending Topics in Assessment and Treatment of Cyber Offenders, presented by Elizabeth Griffin. Before turning this over to Elizabeth, I want to take a few moments to tell you about NERI Press. Our mission is to share current research and best practices emerging in our field. For many years, we accomplished that mission only through book sales. But with changes in the last several years in the publishing and technology worlds, we now disseminate knowledge in several additional ways. Over the last six years, Nuri Press has also offered online courses, a free monthly newsletter, in-person trainings, and these webinars delivered by our internationally recognized authors and other experts in the field. It's important to us here at Nuri Press and Training Center to hear what kinds of information training, resources, and books you want, so please contact us with your suggestions, questions, and feedback, whether positive or negative. Now, for our information, how many of you have participated in a NERI Press webinar before? Jonathan, can you launch the poll, please? All right. So we're getting some votes coming in. That's great. I'll talk more about this at the end of the webinar, but I'd like to make the pitch that if you find these webinars helpful, we hope you'll consider becoming a sponsor of our webinar series. Like Car Talk on NPR, it's your sponsorship that helps make the series happen and allows us to offer our webinars for free to the thousands of clinicians and other professionals who have participate, pa participated in them over the last several years. Please consider becoming a sponsor of this webinar series. If you become a sponsor now, you'll get guaranteed seats to all webinars in the 2018-2019 season. We will register you and 15 staff members of your organization for each webinar, offer you a free gift of two Neary Press books, and mention you in all of our publicity about the webinar series and at each webinar. Before we get started with Elizabeth's presentation, there are a few more things I'd like to share. First, I want to let you know the learning objectives for this webinar. Participants will be able to identify specific assessment tools helpful when evaluating individuals who committed online sexual offenses, discuss concerns and issues related to assessing risk in individuals who commit online sexual offenses, and identify specific treatment issues and helpful treatment interventions for this population. Second, I want to let you know that the YouTube recording from this webinar, as Jonathan mentioned, will be posted on the Neary Press website by November 20th. Slides are currently ready to download from the Neary Press webinar page at nearypress.org slash webinars if you'd like to follow along. As Jonathan mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you can also download the slides right here from your control panel on the right side of your screen. Third, when the webinar is over, please answer the short survey at the end. We would love to have your feedback. And finally, in about a week, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recordings and to a certificate of attendance that you can download. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Elizabeth Griffin is a licensed marriage and family therapist with over 30 years experience treating individuals who've committed sexual offenses. She has worked in outpatient, inpatient, military, and prison settings. Ms. Griffin lectures nationally on the assessment and treatment of sexual offenders, especially individuals who've committed online sexual offenses. She has written numerous professional articles on these topics, and she is the co-author of four books. Ms. Griffin is the founder of Internet Behavior Consulting. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth with a virtual round of applause. Everyone today. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the website address at the bottom of the screen, internetbehavior.com forward slash cyber offenses 2019. That is a web page that I have set up that will have a lot of resources on there for you. Feel free to share it with colleagues. It will be up for all of 2019 and it will have many of the articles and treatment assignments that I referenced today. 
So to get started, I'd really like to talk about some of the theories about online sexual offending. And this, this comes out of Michael Cito's book, which if you treat this population or do assessments with this population, it's a great book to have. Um, it is called Internet Sexual Offenders. And in the book, um, Dr. Cito talks about four somewhat theories about online sexual offending. One theory is that it's just another version of contact sexual offending and there's not anything really different about it. Another theory is that online sexual offending is really associated with problematic internet use, that people start to use technology, have access to so um, much material that is sexual in nature and, and oftentimes discover um, child pornography or discover chatting with adolescents. And so it's really a result of not understanding the dynamics of technology. Another theory is that it's associated with the factors of sexual compulsivity and hypersexuality. And then finally, some people believe it's a completely new form of sexual offending that requires the development of new models to think about it in terms of assessment and treatment. And the reality is it is all of these things. So one of the things that we really talk about in assessment is that you really need to figure out which camp or which theory your client fits into. Because I've seen clients that really can fit into each of these theories of sexual offending online. And based on where they fit, it's really going to direct your treatment needs. So we'll talk about that throughout the presentation today. I want to talk just a minute about language. You'll hear me say the words child pornography offender quite a bit. I'm really trying to change my language to child sexual abuse image offenders. Um, the, the belief in the field is that when we throw around the term child pornography, we really don't stay grounded in what's really happening in these images and videos. And that's the fact that children are being sexually abused. So you'll hear me kind of switch back and forth between those two terms. Um, also in the field, I've started to see more and more people talk about child sexual exploitation material offenders. I personally like child sexual abuse image offenders um, as, as the title I'm trying to go to. And I do think it's uh, important that we help our clients understand that as well. So the focus today is really going to be on child sexual abuse image offenders. Um, there's also a subgroup of online sex offenders, the solicitation offenders. Those are people who often travel typically to meet adolescents or chat in, in chat areas with adolescents. But today we're really going to focus on child sexual abuse image offenders. And at the very basic level, they're broken down into people who view child sexual abuse images, who trades child sexual abuse images, and or produce child sexual abuse images. You'll also see in the literature that people will talk about this group as um, individuals who are fantasy driven only. So they really have no desire to try to meet and be sexual with an actual child versus some of the child sexual abuse image offenders that their goal is to really um, have contact with the child. Again, from Cito's book, he really breaks down that research indicates there's just not one reason why people start looking at child sexual abuse images online. It can be accidental. 30 years ago when I first started in this field, if someone came into my office and said they had accidentally got child sexual abuse images, um, they would have been laughed out of the room because 30 years ago that just wasn't possible. But today, depending on where you are in the online world, it is certainly possible to get these images accidentally. We do know that at times people are curious 
Um, oftentimes we see um, 18, 19 year olds who start looking at images of 14 and 15 year olds because they don't feel very sexually experienced and they get online looking for adolescents and come across images of um, younger kids or adolescents, so they're curious. For some people, they're hypersexual and they often start, the typical story is that they started looking at adult pornography, uh, they became very compulsive or hypersexual with their adult pornography use. And the reality is, if you look at enough um, adult pornography in the online world, you are going to come across child sexual abuse images. And for some people who become so desensitized to pornography in general, they start to gravitate towards some of the more extremes and disturbing forms of pornography, such as child sexual abuse images. For some people, we know they're pedophilic, that they have sexual interest in prepubescent children, or they're hebophilic, which is sexual interest in pubescent children, children who are just starting into puberty, and that interest really drives them to look uh, to technology to find those images. For some people, we know they're collectors, and they may be collectors because they're pedophilic or hebophilic, but they also may be collectors because some of their mental health issues. I had a case out of California, and he had one of the largest collections of child sexual abuse images that have it ever been recorded in the history of California. And while part of it was related to pedophilic interest, the size of the collection was more related to his diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder and some other mental health issues. He also had the largest collection of cat videos anyone had ever seen and the largest collection of videos of cars. So it was more than just being pedophilic or having some pedophilic interest. It was also about his mental health issues. And then, of course, some people, and this is the smallest group that we see in treatment or in the court system, are people who are commercially making um, child sexual abuse images and using them to trade for other material or using them for monetary gain. So before we talk more, I really about assessment issues and some of the questions we have about child sexual abuse image providers. I just wanted to spend a minute on a new field of psychology. In the literature, it's called the psychology of the internet. And really, in this day and age, we should probably call it the psychology of technology because uh, we're, we're broader than just the internet these days. But it really talks about that when we're anonymous, and this comes from the social psychology research of the 60s, that when individuals feel anonymous, that we do and say things we wouldn't normally do or say. A good example is when a college wins the final for basketball championship and um, students like at Duke University, which is a very prestigious university with kids who are very bright and have a lot of opportunities afforded to them, um, that they, you know, go out in the streets and start fires and damage property. And it's because of that feeling that I'm in a crowd and I feel anonymous. So the technology, even though we know on one level we're not anonymous, can make us feel very anonymous. Also with technology, it feels like it's just a fantasy. It's all in my head. It's just a game. There are no rules. So I can do anything I want to in the online world or with technology, and there are no consequences to my behavior. It's also a place that's easy to escape. So when you're somewhere with technology and you want to leave, you've done something that all of a sudden maybe you realize you shouldn't be doing, you just click an X and it just disappears or you just press a button. 
So it feels really easy to escape out of trouble. And in that moment, there are no consequences for what you just did. And it also feels like that everyone's equal and just a friend on the internet. So if someone suggests that you go look at child sexual abuse images at this website, I do it all the time, it's no big deal, um, then people oftentimes will engage in that behavior without completely understanding the ramifications. Uh, we do know from research that the digital, that there's a, a phenomenon called digital disinhibition, and it creates this unique environment when we're online and decreases our ability to think of consequences. The research has shown that when all of us are online, it impairs our ability to be empathetic. And we know that technology can facilitate um, sexual offending through what uh, Al Cooper called the, uh, the AAA engine, uh, accessibility, affordability, and I just blanked on the third one. <laughs> so I was just trying to think of them, just blanked on it, I'll come back to that. Accessibility, affordability, and anonymity, those are the three. So because of that, we all do or say things in the online world that we might not do in our, in our offline world. So we are going to talk about child sexual abuse image offenders, and we're really going to first look at the two major questions. So the first question that everyone always wants to know is, do child sexual abuse image offenders have histories of a hands-on contact offense? And if we really look at the research, there are a number of studies out there, and they range everything from 7% from a study on New Zealand, New Zealand to the infamous Butner study um, in 2008 out of North, the prison in North Carolina. But if you really look at the studies and you get rid of the outliers, so you get rid of the 80% and you get rid of the 7% and the 10%, and you really average it all together, what it looks like or what we think at the moment is around 39 to 40% of child sexual abuse image offenders have a contact offense in their history. And that may be a contact offense we know about or one that we don't know about. And there was an FBI study done in 2016, and they looked at a lot of uh, cases in the federal system. And it came out about 39% looked like they had a past um, sec a contact sexual offense in their history. So it's important to remember you'll see that not everyone does have a past contact offense. Probably the majority at around 55 to 60 percent do not have a history of a past contact offense but a significant number do and we can't forget that as we look at assessment and treatment issues. The second question we have more research on, are child sexual abuse image offenders likely to have a hands-on offense in the future? And what we know is that research is demonstrating that child sexual abuse image offenders tend to be lower on the major criminological factors, such as past criminal history, antisocial personality fe features or traits or personality disorder, lower on substance abuse issues. However, they score higher in the areas of sexual deviance. So many of the clients we see in the system for child sexual abuse images often do, do have some degree of sexual interest and or arousal to prepubescent children. However, they're still lower in risk than a past as someone who has a contact sexual offense. And CEDO calls it the motivation facilitation model, that many of the child sexual abuse image offenders have the motivation, so they have some deviant interest, but they don't have the facilitation factors, which are those criminological factors, such as a past criminal history, antisocial personality traits, or substance use problems with authority. 
So I think that's important to remember that we are going to be looking for deviance in this population, but even with deviance, they're going to be typically lower in risk for a future child pornography offense or a future contact sexual offense because of not having those criminological factors. Because the research really demonstrates that it's the both of those, the, ma the major criminological factors and the interest in deviance that is the deadly combination for risk. The other things that the research are telling us is that um, child sexual abuse image offenders are more likely to have previous pro-social lives. So they have a lot of the protective factors. Oftentimes they have jobs, they have done well in their communities, they you know, have um, some of those factors that we look for for resilience. Um, they do have oftentimes more interpersonal and affective deficits, meaning they have oftentimes um, depression and anxiety and struggle managing those. They have higher levels of, pre of sexual preoccupation and fantasy. Um, so they, they do tend to be hypersexual for some of those and they use sex as coping. Um, they do pretty well on um, community supervision because the research um, is saying they're significantly less likely to miss treatment appointments or drop out of treatment or fail in the community as compared to contact sexual offenders. So why do we need to assess the risk of this group? Why do we need to look at um, each client individually? Uh, when we know that a lot of these clients are low risk? Well, we need to do that because of the risk principle. So the risk principle is from Andrews and Bonta. And what it really says is that high risk clients, high risk sexual offenders need high intensity consequences, supervision and treatment. And if we don't give high risk individuals those things, then they will get worse and be at a higher rate of recidivism. The reverse is true also, that if you take someone who is low risk and you um, give them high intensity consequences, supervision or treatment, they actually get worse as well and become a higher risk for sexual recidivism. So a lot of people feel like that for some of our child sexual abuse image offenders, we are over treating and providing consequences that are not appropriate with their risk level. And that by doing that, we're actually increasing their risk for sexual recidivism, not decreasing their risk for sexual recidivism. So when we look at risk assessments and how do we assess this group, what we know is that the existing risk assessments, such as the static 99R, uh, cannot be used for this group because they were normed on contact sexual offenders and it typically overestimates the risk for child sexual abuse image offenders. Now, obviously, if you have someone who is in the system for child sexual abuse images, but you you know that they have a past contact sexual offense uh, because of previous legal uh, difficulties, pre previous charges or convictions, then you can use the static. But for the group of individuals that are in the system for child sexual abuse image offenders and we don't have a history of a prior contact sexual offender, you can't use the static 99. The risk matrix 2000 has been modified that you can use that, that with child pornography offenders. Um, not a ton of research, but it, it has been used and the research that has been done says that it does fairly well in predicting risk for this category. Michael Cito and Angela Eek developed the child pornography risk tool and they clearly would say that it should anchor your thinking and not be an absolute predictor of risk because 
um, this group, the child sexual abuse image offender, has such a low rate of sexual recidivism, it's been difficult to develop a risk tool that's accurate. In order to develop a really accurate risk tool, you need a large group of individuals who have recidiv recidivated. You need to see what were the factors that separated the group who had recidivism versus the group that had no recidivism. And because child sexual abuse image offenders, to our knowledge, have very low rates of recidivism, it's been really difficult to get an accurate risk tool. On that website, there is a link to the manual that Dr. Cito and Angela Eek have put out in terms of scoring the child pornography offender risk tool. It is uh, in the public domain, so there's no cost to it. So we have put a link to that on the website that I referenced in the beginning. So as you look at the list of factors that are on the seaport, you can see that many of the factors are similar to some of the factors we know are important for looking at recidivism in offline sexual offenders. So we know that if an individual is under the age of 24 at the time of the offense, that they tend to be higher risk. Uh, we know if they have prior criminal history or prior contact offending or haven't done well on conditional release, that they tend to be higher risk. And again, all of those factors are really trying to tap into those criminological factors. Um, as part of the seaport, they look at if there is an admission or diagnosis of child sexual, of sexual interest in children, and they develop the CASIC. And the CASIC is a separate screening tool that you can use when using the seaport or when you have any individual who it has been charged or convicted with child sexual abuse images and really looks at how likely is that individual to have pedophilic interest. And so they look at if they've been married, if they have videos or stories, uh, related to child sexual abuse, if they've been involved in child sexual abuse for more than two years, if they're volunteering in roles that they have access to children, and if they're communicating with children in the online environment. And a score of three or more on this CASIC is an indicator that the person is more likely to have pedophilic interest. And again, in the scoring manual for the seaport, um, they go into great detail about how to score those. The other two factors on the seaport is does the individual have more, more boy than girl contact um, content in the child pornography images? And do they have more boy than girl content? and other child-related materials. So if they've been looking at swimsuits or going online to look at kids that would not be uh, child pornography images, if it's more boy than girl, then that's typically a higher risk factor for recidivism than if the images were focused on prepubescent girls. So what we do know overall is that a large group of child sexual abuse image offenders pose a low risk. Um, there's a small number that do move on in the meadow analysis that uh, CETO did. It was 2%. They, FAUST did a, uh, an analysis of the individuals who were in federal prison in 2009. Um, a new individual, um, new sex offense, including a child pornography offense, was 5%. So we, we do think that overall this group is less at risk to move on to sexual offenses in the future. Slightly higher risk to move on to another child sexual abuse image offense uh, and less risky to move on to a contact offense. What we do know if you're a dual offender, which matches everything we've talked about. So if you have a past contact offense and you have um, anything to do with a violent offense combined with a child pornography offense, that that does make you significantly 
um, more likely to have a future contact offense um, as you move through. So again, we wanna make sure we're getting risk right, because if we don't get it right, then we can't provide the appropriate treatment services and we're increasing recidivism rates. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Um, in an all day workshop, I'd spend a lot of time, but we obviously wanna do a good clinical interview. We wanna do psychological testing, such as the MMPI and the MCMI to determine what mental health pre uh, issues may be present, to determine the presence of antisocial personality disorder, um, traits or features. We want to do a risk ses assessment such as the Seaport or the Risk Matrix 2000. And while the Seaport can be only used to anchor our thinking, when you combine it with everything else, it can be very helpful. Uh, there is an instrument that David Delmonico and I developed along with two probation officers, Rick Parsons and Nick Hoya out of Pennsylvania. And um, sorry, I thought I had a slide there about it. It is called the CAMI. And the CAMI is the Child Abuse um, Material Instrument or Inventory. And this really um, helps us look at the forensic evidence. If you can get access to a forensic report or you're working with probation and they can get access to look at what the forensic evidence is, this is really helpful in determining risk because um, it's important to know, were there 30,000 child sexual abuse images and 100 adult pornography images, or were there 30,000 adult pornography images and 100 child sexual abuse images? While we don't want anyone to have child sexual abuse images, we, knowing that forensic evidence can help us determine was it really more related to pedophilic interest or more related to hypersexuality, sexual compulsivity. So the CAMI is also on that website that I told you about. Um, there's also an article that we wrote for Probation Magazine that really talks about scoring the CAMI. In terms of treatment, I've often had individuals complete, the client complete the CAMI and then uh, done a polygraph just based on the CAMI if they've been honest about um, how, how large their collection was, what ages was it focused around, was it focused more on boys versus girls. So the CAMI is really developed from what the research tells us are important factors to look at. Then also we wanna do a physiological assessment. So that may be a polygraph to determine if there is a past history of contact offenses. That's really important because if there is and we can get some evidence and we know that the risk level is gonna be much higher than someone who doesn't have a history of contact offenses. Uh, we want to um, try to determine an individual's sexual interest. Currently, there are three products on the market, the ABLE screen of, for sexual interest, the affinity um, measure of sexual interest, and the look. Um, I, I have all three. I typically use two out of the three because it gives me more confidence in the results, but it really, basically what we're looking for is, do you have interest in prepubescent children? That is the, the main thing that I'm looking for when I'm assessing for risk. And then obviously there's the penile pathismograph or the PPG. Those are a little bit more difficult at times to uh, have done during the evaluation process and people are more likely not to have significant results on the PPG during the evaluation process. But if possible, um, if the polygraph and the, the able affinity or look have contradictory evidence or something that doesn't fit, sometimes I look to the PPG to help me sort out um, arousal to prepubescent children. Uh, we also wanna look at protective factors. Um, I think that 
in a lot of these cases, in the individuals have a lot of these protective factors. And we know that while risk factors increase risk, protective factors can decrease risk. So I think it's important that we look at, and protective factors can also be helpful in predicting success in treatment. So we want to look for protective factors and look for the strengths of the client as well. Um, people always kind of want to kind of want to know about treatment in terms of how do we determine whether it is appropriate to put treatment individuals who've committed child sexual abuse image crimes or individuals who've committed solicitation crimes online with contact sexual offenders. And there's a debate about that in the field. I would say overall, if you really look to the research about matching treatment to risk level, that in an ideal world, we would take our technology offenders who've only offended with technology and in the online world and treat them separately than we treat our contact sexual offenders. Because our the treatment needs are gonna be different. Um, there, we're going to have low risk guys mixed in with more moderate to high risk guys. Uh, so overall, I kind of fall on the side that we need to treat them in separate groups. Now, that doesn't mean that always happens. I have a group right now that is a mixed group because I just don't have enough people um, to do two groups of technology only guys. So, um, but keep it in mind as you look at treatment. We do know that the treatment issues for this group have started to pull from the literature. So we cannot call these dynamic risk factors yet because dynamic risk factors are treatment issues that research has demonstrated that if we treat and they get better, then recidivism is decreased. So we don't have the research with this population to say for sure that these treatment issues, that if we treat them, it will decrease recidivism. And again, it's gonna be a little hard to get that information with this population because we don't have high recidivism rates that we know about at the moment. But the literature has started to pull the treatment issues that we believe are gonna be important to treat with this group. Uh, emotional regulation, helping this group learn how to manage their anxiety and depression. We're seeing a lot of literature that talks about high levels of anxiety and depression among the group of child sexual abuse image offenders. We know that for a subset of child sexual abuse image offenders, they really struggle with social skills and intimacy deficits. So that's another area that we need to be focused on in treatment. As I talked about earlier, we know that many individuals in this group struggle with deviant arousal or deviant interest. Maybe it doesn't always reach the threshold of arousal, but there is oftentimes some interest in prepubescent children. And if we don't help our clients understand that, uh, we do believe that this would be an issue that would increase risk. Online hypersexuality. So for some of these clients, they're hypersexual both, both online and offline. However, a number of them, their hypersexual behavior started once they discovered pornography in the online world. And so really helping them address their hypersexual behavior either through um, uh, some 12-step groups can be helpful, uh, if a person has had a long history of hypersexual online behavior, they oftentimes need medication to really get that and manage that, but really making sure we're addressing that treatment. Then to really help people understand problematic technology use, we're still not doing a great job in teaching people how to be healthy in the online world. Um, I'm a big advocate for trying to teach children, started at a very young age, 
about how to use technology in healthy ways. And we tend to wait till they're in junior high or high school to have these discussions. And those aren't the best times. A lot of kids are already in trouble at that point. So with our clients, we really need to address technology use and give them skills for really understanding how to be healthy in the online world. Um, lots of states I know just say, we're not gonna allow individuals with sex offenses to have access to technology. And the reality is the courts are starting to strike that down. It becomes almost impossible to find a job or do many things that you need to do in life without uh, having access to technology. So we're going to need to start helping clients do that. And then victim awareness. Um, this isn't pulling really strong in the research yet, but I think most of us who specialize in treating child sexual abuse image offenders would say that we really need to help this group of clients to understand the damage that is done. Uh, to victims who's uh, who not only by the child sexual abuse that has occurred, but by their images being shared. So on the ATSA listserv last week, and I can't remember who the article is by, Jill Levinson sent out the article. I will make sure it gets on that website, but it was a great article about uh, David Finkelhor's group. I'm sure the article is at the Crimes Against Children Research Center website because this article was um, put out by David Finkelhor's group. And it really talked about the research they've done looking at the damage to, um, to children as they age when their images have been shared and when their the images of their sexual abuse have been shared online. And it was a great article. It can be very useful in treatment. Jill talked about how she, with her group, talked to her group and went through the article about what um, the victims said about the lasting impact of having their um, sexual abuse images put in the online world. So that can be a great resource and I'll make sure the article also gets on the web page. So you can find some treatment ideas specifically for this group at another website that David and I created. It's internetbehavior.com forward slash Therapeutic Toolbox 2017. We did an article for the ATSA forum and we uh, created, um, I think there are five or six treatment exercises that are specifically for child sexual abuse Im image uh, offenders, really addressing problematic technology use and victim awareness. So I think I'm about out of time, and that works, I think, uh, around the time frame that I need to be ending. So I'll take some questions at this time. Um, I need to turn on my webcam, unfortunately. <laughs> so hold on just a minute. Let me get that on. Okay. Hello, Elizabeth. Thank you. That was fascinating and very informative, and we've got a bunch of questions for you. Okay, great. So first, I mentioned to you earlier that a number of our folks are child and adolescent clinicians, and they uh, were asking for clarification on whether the studies you cited were about adults only, and I think that's true. Am I correct in thinking that? That is true. Uh, you, you know, in the field as a whole, we don't have um, a ton of research about adults but it's certainly a growing body of research, but there is almost zero information or research related to kids. I did reference the Crimes Against Children Research Center, and that group has probably done the most research about looking at kids and their online behavior, so I would definitely um, take a look at their website because they're going to have some good resources for you on that website. Great. Even in the absence of a lot of research literature, I think all of us as clinicians and as parents have been confronted with this environment where sexting and Snapchat are rampant. And we have adolescents who are in the throes of hormones 
and are sending each other what would be legally considered pornographic images, naked pictures of themselves or somebody else who's underage. How do you think about that um, if you're asked to evaluate those kinds of cases by the court? How do you analyze those cases? So David Delmonico and I did write an article on this exact issue. And um, unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the article, but it is on um, sexting issues. And I'll make sure it's up on that website. But we, and we didn't, this really wasn't uh, tons of original ideas. What we did is we looked at the research and the literature and what does it tell us about who is low risk and when is it a developmental issue and when is it more of a high risk issue and when is it look like it is really exploitive behavior that's starting to set a pattern uh, for more dangerous behavior in the future and so what we really found was there are markers you can start to look at in terms of um um, if, if a juvenile has been into trouble um, with some delinquent behavior, is this a juvenile who is really, versus a juvenile who's really immature and developmentally um, maybe not quite at their peer level, is curious about sexuality, is making some really bad decisions, but doesn't have those delinquency markers that would indicate that the behavior is really setting a pattern for exploitive behavior in the future. So I will make sure that article gets on the web page, but we go through a lot of the assessment pieces for trying to separate those two groups. Great. And before you move on, um, would you mention that web page again, please? One person asked that you repeat that. Sure. It is internetbehavior.com forward slash cyber offenses, all one word, 2019. And there is not a space. It's all cyber offenses, 2019, no spaces. And if you have trouble, um, um, accessing that site. Craig, is there a way that people can, is my email address available? I think it's on the original slide okay. and that okay. will be available with the handouts that they download. You can certainly email me if you have any trouble accessing that uh, site. I'll make sure you get access to it. Great. Thanks for your comments about the kids because I think all of us who work in the field have a sense that a 40 year old who's looking at naked pictures of children is very different than a 14 year old for whom that's a developmentally normative kind of um, activity, even activity, though the grown ups yes. they wish he wouldn't. Um, someone also asked, is there a cost to using the Seaport and the CSAI? Are those free? Nope, they're free. They're in the public domain. And on the website I talked about, there is a link to both uh, the instrument as well as the scoring manual that goes with that. Great, good to know. Um, do you think about the um, risk needs responsivity model at all when you're talking about um, how to analyze treatment needs of people? You alluded to it when you talked about Andrews and Bonta. What would you think of the, um, the, the needs, the criminogenic needs of these guys who are um, a little bit higher functioning, it sounds like, less criminal activity. Um, how would you begin to think about maybe a good lives model approach to these guys or risk needs responsivity approach? So um, if we look at the research, I definitely, I am risk needs responsivity and good lives. Those are kind of the two models I base my treatment foundation on. So if we look at that mostly are low, low risk, uh, one of the things, as I said earlier, at the moment, we don't have clear research to tell us exactly what the criminogenic needs are of this group, though we have research that's starting to say, here are the treatment issues. So that slide that really gives those treatment issues, uh, emotional dysregulation, social uh, skills and intimacy deficits, deviant arousal, 
um, problematic internet use or technology use, and then hypersexuality. Those are the treatment issues that are really starting to pull as issues we need to address. We just don't have research yet to say that if we address those issues, recidivism decreases. And that's partly because we don't have enough people recidivating in this group at high enough rates that we can really say what the criminogenic needs are gonna be. So we, at, the, at this moment, we just have to trust what we have so far. And that those are the criminal, the, treatment needs that are that are pulling that we hope to sometime someday have the research that says those are our criminogenic needs and then if anyone's ever heard me present i am super um super motivated with this group to use responsivity techniques because oftentimes there's a subgroup of these individuals who are very bright who can write beautiful assignments and they sound really good and yet they're very they're not very meaningful to them so often in treatment you need to look to some different ways experiential pieces you need to look to some other types of responsivity uh, treatment ideas to really determine how well they're doing in treatment. Great. And could you remind us again, please, of the final percentage of offenders who watch child sexual abuse and then go on to commit a hands-on offense? So I, I, I don't want to say this is final because, you know, <laughs> this, field, this little subfield of our work is very new. At the moment, we, the research, if you looked at all the research, would say that two to five percent go on to have some type of future sexual offense crime. Uh, on the lower end, probably two to three percent for a contact offense, and on the higher end, probably five to seven percent for a child pornography offense. Um, I will say that I think people who go on to commit a, another child pornography offense, it's probably higher than we know about because it's the behavior that people can do and not be detected. So I do think there are higher rates of going back to look at child pornography again. However, there's no research at the moment to back that up. That's just a personal opinion. Great. So it's important for us to keep in mind when we get a referral, whether the question is the future risk of looking at additional child sexual abuse materials or the risk of a hands-on offense. Those are two very different questions. Those would be two very different questions, correct. Great. Um, another question, could you remind us again, please, of what constitutes the triple A engine? Um, affordability, accessibility, and anonymity. Everybody really remembered that. They just wanted to see if you did. I know. I was just, in my head. I was thinking, oh, why did they have to ask that? Can I remember <laughs> that? <laughs> well, one more developmental kind of question. If we're thinking about risk needs responsivities, I think many of us who worked with kids have come across autism spectrum disorder kids who get involved in looking at um, naked pictures of children or even children engaged in sexual activity sometimes accidentally it actually does happen as you said and like many things that they perseverate on they're often running and maybe collecting huge numbers of these just like they collect Yu-Gi-Oh cards or magic cards right. have you tried to treat any youngsters or adolescents with spectrum disorders i do not treat adolescents i have treated a number of adults who um, have official diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. It really is a difficult group in terms of technology because technology can be so um, such a positive influence in their life and really help them build social skills and build other skills. And it is a population that's very vulnerable to child to viewing child sexual abuse images. Um, so I don't have any magic answers for treatment. I have found that, you know, oftentimes we have to figure out the best filters and monitoring systems we can for that group. And there needs to be a lot of accountability. Um, I have found that um, 
the you know with adults it's a little bit easier because they oftentimes do have some ability to make decisions about what's right and wrong and if you can really establish the rules and help them understand the consequences and the impact to the victims that can be very helpful but it is a process and it takes a lot of patience um, but unfortunately, I don't treat juveniles, so I really can't speak to just the kid part of it. And one thing, whether it's adult spectrum clients or, or adolescent spectrum clients, the, the issue of understanding the victim's perspective is often difficult because right. that's a fundamental yeah. aspect of the disorder. Right. And sometimes it's easier to teach them how to act in their own self-interest rather than because they are aware that it's going to harm someone else. Right. And yes. Even though we wish they had empathy, that that's maybe asking a little too much for what their limitations are. Yes. Very true. Very true. Well, I want to thank you so much for giving us this incredible and illuminating talk. And I'm going to go into our little closing spiel here. Thank you thank again. You. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. So, Jonathan, do we have our next set of slides for us? We've got our um, full lineup for the upcoming webinar season, which you can view here and also on our website, um, nearypress.org. We are also offering um, paid CE credits for psychologists and social workers for all the webinars in our 2018-2019 season. For details about how to obtain CE credits, please visit nearypress.org slash webinars, where you'll find a description of our CE process. If you still have questions, you can email Kristen at klobish at niri.com. Niri Press also publishes a free monthly newsletter in which we discuss a new or controversial journal article or research paper and examine its implications for clinicians in the field. You are automatically signed up for this resource if you're attending the webinar, and we hope you'll find it useful. Please consider becoming a sponsor for our 2018-2019 webinar series. We're excited to begin planning a brand new slate of webinars covering new and crucial knowledge in the field, guided by you, our listeners. To our previous sponsors in the 2017-2018 series, thank you for your commitment to the Neary Press webinar series. We would like you to consider renewing your sponsorship for this year if you haven't already. When you sign up to be a sponsor, as our thanks to you, we'll send you two popular Neary Press titles, current applications, and current perspectives, or two new books if you've already received these two. If you become a sponsor now, you'll get guaranteed seats to all of our webinars in the 2018-2019 season. And if you sign up as an organization, your organization is guaranteed 15 seats. We will also do your monthly registration for you and we'll publicize your name or organization on our website, in our publicity, and on each webinar. Sponsorship is $98 for individuals and $250 for organizations. If you're interested in being a sponsor, please contact, contact us directly at info at nearypress.org or call us. Finally, thank you to our brand new 2018-2019 sponsors. You can see them here on the screen. They are organizations, agencies, and individuals. We would not be able to bring you these webinars without their support. If you like this webinar, you can see our previous webinars on our website at nearypress.org and on the Neary Press YouTube channel. It is possible to pay for CE credits for all past recorded webinars. Thanks again to Liz for a great webinar and a huge thank you to all of you for attending. I'd like to say again how much we welcome your feedback, so please complete your evaluation form when you close out the webinar. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>